Good afternoon and welcome. Welcome to Transmedia Live 2019. Welcome to our panel, Creating Commons, Affects, Collectives, Aesthetics. My name is uh, Daphne Dragona and I'm the curator of the talks program for the festival. So this year's edition, as you have noticed, has no title. And this happens in order to emphasize the affective dimensions of the, today's digital culture and to allow room for its multiple expressions and manifestations. Of interest for the development of the program this year have been questions like what moves and what mobilizes people today, what motivates social engagement, and how can new forms of care and solidarity be developed and embodied. Within this context, the commons, along with their practices and their communities, are of course of great importance. This is because the commons always depend on the will and the desire of their actors, their contributors, for bonds, associations, and connections. And the commons also, of course, hold the potential for inclusive and heterogeneous ways of being, acting, and working together. To discuss this topic, we are happy to have with us scholars and practitioners who have actively engaged with this topic. The panel is curated and will be moderated by Cornelia Solfrank and Felix Talder as part of their ongoing research, Creating Commons. And I would like to quickly introduce Cornelia and Felix before I pass over the mic to them. So Cornelia is a conceptual artist, interdisciplinary researcher and educator with a PhD in the field of art and intellectual property. Her interest lies in, experimental, in experimenting with new models of authorship in continuing various forms of artistic appropriation and in deconstructing myths around geniality and originality. She conducts research in the field of art and commons since 2012 and she's currently associate researcher working on this topic at the Zurich University of the Arts. Cornelia is of course also known for her work in art, digital network technologies and gender politics. Her most recent book, Die Schönen Kriegerinnen, The Beautiful Warriors, is presented as part of our program later today at the cafe stage. Felix Talder is a professor for digital culture at the Zurich uh, University of the Arts, a senior researcher at the World Information Institute in Vienna, and a moderator of Net Time. His work focuses on the intersection of cultural, political, and technological dynamics, examining in particular new modes of common space production, copyright, and the transformation of subjectivity. In his most recent work, Felix is discussing the digital commons in relation to personal participation, agency, and new forms of solidarity. He's the author and editor of numerous books, and most recently of Digital Solidarity and Kultur uh, der Digitalität. Please welcome Cornelia, Felix, and the speakers of the panel. Thank you. So many thanks to Daphne for the introduction and also for the collaboration on this panel. And a very warm welcome from our side to our guests here on stage, Jeremy Gilbert, Laurence Russell, and Kerry Hall. Many thanks for joining us today and also, of course, welcome to the audience. Before Felix is going to introduce the topic of the day and the questions we are intending to discuss with our guests, I would like to fill you in on the context within which this discussion is located. As already indicated in the title of this panel, it has something to do with creating commons. And why creating commons describes a generic activity of actively building commons, it is also the name of our three-year three -year research project we are conducting at the University of the Arts in Zurich. We, as a team of three, Felix Stalder, Shusha Niederberger is somewhere in the audience, and myself. The project receives funding from the Swiss National Fund, SNF, to explore the potential of aesthetic practices to build, contribute, and to maintain the commons. So the two fields we are connecting in our research are aesthetic practice and the notion of the commons. When we speak of the commons as the reference framework for our research, we use the term in its most general sense, in which commons can be described as alternative modes of ownership and collective ways of dealing with resources. The term refers to common goods, 
but it also includes the social relations and negotiations necessary to produce and protect them. Thus, commons constitute a research field in which economic, ecological, political, philosophical, social and mental issues overlap in complex ways. As we are neither interested in dealing with commons as an ideology, namely that of commonism, nor as the utopian model of how we want things to become in the future, the structural definition by political economist Massimo de Angelis and architect and commons researcher Stavros Stavridis turned out to provide a useful reference for us. In their text on the commons, the authors elaborate that in order to constitute a commons, three elements are needed. First, a pool of resources, goods, tangible or intangible, rival or non-rival in nature. Second, a community of people who create and sustain the resources, the so-called commoners. Third, the social process of commoning, that means the work that is necessary to administrate the goods, the making of the rules of self-governance, the daily negotiations. This purely structural approach does not theoretically overburden the commons, thus leaving space for various disciplinary approaches and also allowing for a high degree of variability with regards to specific formations of the commons. For our research, we decided to take as a starting point already existing projects, projects that have been created and are run by artists. Their specific practices mainly refer to digital commons and they traverse fields such as intellectual property, and archives, pedagogy, self-organization, autonomous institutions, tools and infrastructures. We currently have 16 projects in our pool for which we have found the categories archives and libraries, independent institutions, and tools and infrastructures. And of course, many of the projects address overlapping issues, which is why these categories are meant to be preliminary working tools more than scientific classifications. I would like to give you one example from the archive and library section so that you can get a clearer picture of where our interest lies. The project Monoscope, you find on the internet on, under monoscope.org, is a free repository aggregating, documenting and mapping works, artists and initiatives related to the avant-garde, media arts, theory and activism. It provides both an exhaustive indexical overview of those fields and also digital access to rare historic documents. Its spiritus rector and movens is artist Dujan Barok, who has built the underlying infrastructure and while the project is related to the movement for open access and provides unrestricted access to resources, it also contributes to establishing alternative regimes of knowledge and creates a community of contributors built on effective relationships. We are framing these projects as commons, but they go beyond the classical understanding of the commons. And while we are interested in continuing the commons discourse by expanding it into the field of aesthetic practices, one of our main interests is also to develop an aesthetic theory for these projects that operate both on a symbolic level in the context of art, but also have a functionality that is totally independent from this framing as art. In this context, we understand aesthetics as a way of giving form to society and our contemporary human condition, and it's our interest to extend traditional aesthetics by conceiving an aesthetics of the commons. And this will also be the title of our upcoming book that we are producing during this year. It would be an aesthetics of the real in which fiction has already become reality and reality is constructed in the shadows of human imagination. To help us with that under 
taking, we count on the number of theoreticians that will contribute to our upcoming um, publication. And that's also in this capacity that, that we have this, uh, the experts here today on the panel. And uh, we're very much looking forward also to the, to the discussion for once, but also to your contribution to our book. Thank you, and I hand over to Felix. Thank you, um, Cornelia. My task is now to frame, as she said, the focus of the conversation, what we want to do um, this afternoon. But first, let me briefly introduce the guests on the panel. To my right, to your left, is uh, Jeremy Gilbert. He's a professor uh, of cultural and political theory at the University of East London, and among many other things, also the author of a fantastic book called Common Ground, Democracy and Collectivity in the Age of Individualism, which you can find over at the, at the book's uh, shop. The book was really important to us because it articulates a very broad vision of culture as a way of being in the world, a way which is not only but also symbolic, but is also productive. To my left is Gary Hall. He's a professor of media and performing arts at Coventry University. Among the many things um, that are particularly important to us is in 2006, he co-founded Open Uni uh, Humanities Press, the first open access press dedicated to contemporary critical and cultural theory. But he's also holds a strong interest in what we could perhaps term the less official approaches to open access, shadow libraries and archives. In 2016, he published uh, another book that was important for us, Pirate Philosophy, which focuses on new models of creation, publication, and dissemination of knowledge, um, challenging the received ideas of originality, authorship, and what constitutes a book. Also, this book you can pick up at the book store uh, outside. I think without the book in her luggage is um, uh, Laurence Rassel. Well, at least I couldn't find it in the bookstore over there. Uh, Laurence is an artist and cultural worker with a strong interest in institutional forms. For us and for the, the research that we've been doing have been of particular importance that um, in 1997, um, Laurence co-founded Constant, a non-profit association and interdisciplinary arts lab in Brussels, which is still very active, uh, not the least here at uh, Transmediale uh, in these days. Uh, after many years at Constant, she left and worked for seven years as a director of the Fondation Anthony Tapies in Barcelona. Since mid-2016, she uh, is director of the most experimental art school in Brussels. <laughs> and thanks to her direction, probably in the whole of Europe. I can't speak about the whole world, I'm sorry. I'm very Eurocentric here. Uh, but it's in Brussels, so it's fitting for Europe, the École de Recherche Graphique. To frame the conversation on the role of art and culture, as a way of articulating a different vision of practice. I want to start with a somewhat longer quote from, oops, from Simondon, which I took from Jeremy's book, uh, Common Ground. You can see it behind me, but since this is a very long quote and it's difficult to read, I will read it for you. Um, so this is the quote. If we can speak in a certain sense of the individuality of a group or of a people. It is not by virtue of a community of action, too discontinuous to be a solid basis, nor of an identity of conscious representations, too broad and too continuous to allow the segregation of groups. Rather, it is at the level of affecto emotional themes, mixtures of representation and actions, that collective groupings constitute themselves. 
inter-individual participation is possible when affective emotive expressions are the same. The vehicles of this effective community are elements in the life of groups which are effective but which are not only symbolic. The regime of sanctions and rewards, symbols, the arts, objects which are collectively valorized and devalorized. Okay, so this is quite a quote. So, but what, what could it mean or why are we interesting, interested and perhaps also why did Jeremy put it very prominently in his book? Although I won't speak to that. Um, why are we interested uh, in it and we're happy to find it there? Simon Don, in our view, raises the following question. How does a group of people become more than a simple aggregation of singular positions? but is able to create a sense of unity and of coherence, a sense of itself as a collectivity. And is not, this is not because of a shared purpose or a unity of action. This is not enough as these things are too diverse and too shifting. But it's also not a shared representation, say a national flag or a symbol, that would be too general. Rather. It is through what he calls affecto emotional themes, which we understand as shared ways of feeling the present and sensing the future. It is this shared sense par that's partially explicit, partially implicit, that this sense of the actual and the sense of the possible that provides the basis for people to recognize each other and their relationships. And these themes are not abstract ideas, but they are materially created, expressed and transformed through forms of representation and forms of action, constantly re-evaluated and transformed collectively. Simondon explicitly includes the arts as working on the level of affects that need to be shared in order for a community to be able to constitute itself. And this is what we are trying to focus on in relation to the commons. What are the relationships between representation and action? What is the role of the arts in giving shape, developing an aesthetics of the commons? The discourse of the commons tends to be dominated by three perspectives. Economists see it as an alternative way of producing or maintaining resources outside the market and its orientation on prices, but also outside the command structures of the state. Legal scholars see the commons and talk about the commons as an alternative regime of property rights. And political theories see it as an alternative set of social institutions and political arrangements developed through them. These perspectives, of course, are important, but we feel there is something missing. The dimension of affects, the dimension of desires, the dimension of culture. What we want to focus now is on this missing dimension, not because we think it's the most important one, because any complex phenomena has a lot of important dimensions, but because we think that arts and culture are particularly powerful in articulating and thus transforming affects and they can, can contribute something to the larger movement that is seeking to develop a world beyond total commodification and surveillance. I said at the beginning that we are trying to have a conversation rather than a typical panel discussion. And we want to try to do this in this kind of uh, particular setting of this room in the following way. We asked each of the three participants to give us a short 10-minute introduction relating their own work to the, to the focus of the discussion. After each of these short um, kind of introductions or, or contributions, we give you a, a, question, a, a chance to ask questions of clarification. No discussion uh, that will come later, but if there's something that was unclear or that you would like to have you know, a brief explanation or elaboration, you can raise that immediately after. 
and if, there's, if it goes into discussion, I'll take down a note and we come back to it later. And then we, we will, once we have all the three statements, we will try to, to weave through them uh, to the common theme and open it up again to, um, to you. So let's get started with um, Jeremy. Uh, yes, the, the microphones are in, in the room. What? <coughs> okay. okay. So um, Jeremy, it's up to you. Okay, thanks. Um, well, thanks very much for inviting me and to the, putting together this uh, really intriguing panel. And the question I was given to answer, to address in this uh, opening section was, um, what, what is the role of affect in be the becoming of the common or community? So I'm going to try to address that question. And Although I think in many ways what I'll be doing is really sort of unpacking that quote from, from Gilbert Simondon um, and some of its implications and explaining some of its terms. So I think first I'll give, a, I'll briefly sort of define what we mean by affect because I know it's, it's a vague term and it's a term that not everybody is familiar with and it gets used in multiple ways. So affect, the term is often used just as a synonym for emotion or um, emotion uh, and I would say that's always problematic because although uh, when we talk about affect we are talking about a dimension of experience which includes emotions uh, it's also broader than that because the term designates uh, a, a dimension you know dimensions of experience that include physical sensation they include interpersonal um, you know interpersonal experiences um, it, there's a whole kind of continu continuum of experience and a whole dimension of experience and communication that is designated by the term. So the way in which I always like to explain this is to say that affect uh, designates uh, that dimension of communication, for one thing, which is um, carried by the tone of the voice, the tone of the speaking voice, as opposed to the semantic content of an utterance, is what carries the affective charge of a spoken utterance, if we're talking about speech. And of course, you know, sort of pop psychology and kind of the theorists of social communication will tell us that very often uh, the tone of the voice is more important in terms of what is actually communicated than the semantic content of an utterance. Now, I think this is a good example. It's a, it's a good example to think about, partly because what happens with the tone of it, when the tone of a voice changes, um, the um, you know, what happens is, you know, the actual physical body of the speaker is, is changing its state, is becoming more or less excited, is becoming more, you know, the throat is more or less constricted, the heart rate is slower or faster, and this is actually communicated in some way to the listener. This is something, something of that physical state is registered by the physical state of the listener, and this has an effect. Um, at the same time, the classical the definition of affect, which comes from Spinoza, um, really comes into... So English language cultural theory via Brian Masumi's sort of readings of Simon Don and Spinoza and Deleuze, and is now very often repeated, is that affect always designates an augmentation or a diminution of the body's capacity to act. So even if it's only a very slight change, that a change in affective state is always a change of a body's capacity to act. And a body might mean a singular human body, it might mean a group of people together, it might mean anything really. Uh, we don't really have time to unpack this, you know, in, in any great detail here, but I think but it is really significant because for one thing it it leads to a very different understanding of phenomena like pleasure and pain to the understanding of them that you would get, say, from the psychoanalytic tradition. Psychoanalytic tradition thinks that pleasure is about um, satisfying a need, whereas the Spinozan tradition thinks that pleasure is, is used as, and forms a positive affect, are always about becoming capable of doing something, if only momentarily, that you couldn't do before. Uh, yeah, I mean, I'm a, you know, I work on music a lot of the time, I'm a DJ, so the, the example I always give is the, the capacity, the way in which music, you know, creates the capacity for dance, which wasn't there before you heard it. So, okay, having established in some sense, you know, what do we mean by affect? Well, 
what is its role in the becoming of the commons? Well, in very basic sense, as Simon Don says in that quote, I would say that affect simply is the primary medium of social relations. Aff affective experience is the domain in which, through which social bonding occurs. It's the domain through which um, social you know, groups are formed. Uh, and what does this mean, though, and, and why does it matter? Well, as Simon Don says in that quote, it, it, it means that certain aspects of, sort of culture and social experience that really throughout the 20th century were often assumed within sort of academic disciplines and sort of broader political discourse to be the central means by which group formations occurred are maybe not as primary and was often assumed. So uh, social sort of groups, group relations, collectivities are not only or even primarily articulated through um, through discourse, through meaning, through symbolic activity, and through um, the formation of group identities. All those things do happen, but they tend to happen on the basis of a sort of relational infrastructure, um, which is affective in nature. Uh, and, it, and it's this kind of relational infrastructure from which the common and the collective tend to emerge. Um, in concrete terms, you know, people start to you know, behave like they belong to a group. Or, or are socialised into behaving like they belong to a group, first and foremost because they feel like they belong to that group and they feel like they have something in common with the other members of that group and, and with that group as a collectivity, you know, rather, than prime, rather than initially being sort of persuaded of anything or, or even induced to identify with anything in particular. This would be the argument anyway. Oh, I'm going to make my stopwatch work. Okay, that's all, <laughs> all right. So now, okay, but then why else, you know, why might that matter sort of politically? And one reason that matters is because generally speaking, we tend to conceptualize affective relations as in some sense both sort of more lateral as occurring between members of groups, between people in social situations, rather than, um, you know, as distinct from other types of relation. So, a sort of, there's a long tradition that goes back several hundred years that includes uh, Freud, that includes sort of contemporary theories of populism, and that tradition tends to assume that what it means to belong to a group is that you, each member of the group, has a sort of singular identification with the leader or the imagined leader or the, you know, or the flag or something. This is the theory according to which, you know, if you kill the general, the army will disperse. The, the members of the army only belong to the army to the extent that they each individually have something identify, you know, they identify in some way with the general, the leader or the country or the flag or the king, and that there's nothing holding them together in a sort of lateral sense. Now, sometimes that may be true, but the trouble with this is if this is your model of how social relations come into existence and function, then you basically have no place in your model for the basic experience of solidarity, of solidarity between, you know, between people in all kinds of collective situations. And this really um, is very problematic and I think it's just inaccurate. I mean, that clearly, that clearly it's just not always true, um, that sort of model. So I think at the same time, it's important because affective relations are material in nature. They sort of, um, you know, material, you know, their, and their materiality is, is a very important thing to understand. They're not primarily symbolic, or they don't primarily take place in a kind of ideal domain. Now, this is all partly important because I think it has implications for our understanding of the conditions of possibility for the emergence of what I like to call potent collectivities. Uh, groups which are actually capable of acting in the world rather than just being acted upon. Groups which are capable of acting creatively, which are capable of giving expression to their in internal and intrinsic complexity in order to have effects upon the world. And I think one of the implications of this model that I'm sort of proposing and, and taking from people like Simon Don and others is that, well, really, the collective experience and, and potent collectivity always depends in part on... Uh, what Spinoza's philosophers call joyous affect. And joyous affect uh, is, is a kind of technical term. It doesn't just mean being kind of happy and ecstatic. It means experiencing an enhancement of one's capacities to act by virtue of an enhancement of one's capacities um, to make positive, engage in positive relations uh, with other bodies. 
Now, this is very abstract, but I think it does have a really concrete correlate in terms of our understanding of a basic question of what are the conditions under which people come together and act effectively in the world. And I would say the implication of this idea is that, is that, the, is that, nor, is that generally speaking, those things happen. Potent collectivities emerge, especially collectivities which are capable of resisting oppression of some kind when people have some kind of experience, however momentary, of collective agency um, and of collective empowerment. Now, why is this important? It's important because there's a very, very deeply held assumption, uh, for instance, on much of the political left, that this is not how collective agency is induced. The assumption tends to be that the way in which, in fact, the way in which you get, pe the way in which the conditions under which you know, potent collectivities emerge or revolutionary collectivities emerge is, is conditions of extreme oppression. That when pe the more people are oppressed, the more people are subjugated, the more people are exploited, the more likely they are to fight back. Um, and I would say that's, it's a very deeply held assumption. It's a kind of re instinctive reflex that in, in, in here's in a great deal of political analysis, and it's just completely wrong. There's just no empirical historical basis for that assumption whatsoever. There are plenty of examples of populations being subject to intense and extreme oppression for hundreds of years, in some cases, without potent collectivity emerging. It only emerges at those moments when some experience of collective agency and collective empowerment occurs which means that it becomes a very important sort of political and cultural strategy to try to induce those experiences where possible. It's not to say that oppression doesn't matter. It's not to say it's not part of the conditions of emergence for uh, radical sort of collective agencies, but it's never sufficient and it's never the trigger. Uh, people hate me saying this. People absolutely hate me saying this because people are very deeply attached to the idea that more oppression yeah, is what will produce revolutionary subjectivity. Again, I say, give me, give me one historical example I'll, and I'll, uh, of that actually being the process, and I'll change my view. Um, and I think that's a really important sort of note to finish on, that really, that is, that if, if what we want, um, if what we want, and I think we all do, is sort of potent collectivities in the world which are, which are capable of resisting, exploitation and oppression at a time when global capital is intensifying its exploitative and oppressive capacities uh, you know, ever more you know, effectively, then it's very important to understand that this. I think it's also important to understand that, that normally what, and this relates to the idea of affect in ways I don't really have time to un unpack here, that what really tends to um, uh, you know, underpin those experiences of collective agency, of potent collectivity, is a, is a felt sense, an effective sense of shared interests, of people feeling that people will act together when they feel they feel that they have something in common, and that something that they have in common is not necessarily an identity, it's not necessarily uh, a nationality or a gender, it's a, it's a sense of shared um, potential for becoming, uh, which is being blocked, which you know might, or, you know, which you know, which they're acting together gives them the capacity to realise. I think that's a very important observation because I think the assumption that that, that what makes effective collectivities is in fact is some sort of shared identity or some shared narrative about the world uh, is a very widespread assumption and it's one which tends to not make for effective political or cultural strategies. So I'll leave it there. Um, thank you very much. Is there any immediate question that you want a very specific point to be? You have to go to the microphone. Um, but please limit to really points of clarification. Uh, yes, I was just wondering if you have any proposed strategies for creating these con conditions for this to happen. Oh, no. <laughs> yeah, no. Well, yeah, I, I mean, well, it's a, I think it's a reasonable, uh, yeah, it's a reasonable question. I would say that, yeah, it depends on what scale you're talking about. I have all kinds of proposals. I mean, it depends on what scale you're talking about. Or what, and um, I would say that one of the implications of this thinking, though, is that there's, for example, if you're coming at these issues from a sort of revolutionary perspective or a kind of very radical perspective, then I think it's one of the implications of this. I think is to what is to really erase the distinction between, say, a reformist politics and a revolutionary politics. Because I would say that historically, 
you can look at very isolated examples like the Russian Revolution when the kind of crisis of czarism pr produces conditions for sort of revolutionary emergence. But broadly speaking, historically, you get a more radical generation, more radical political generations emerging from situations where people have had their basic needs met, where people have had basic, you know, basic social reforms, have kind of created, a, you know, have kind of removed precarity from people's situations. Does this make sense? So I think that's part of the answer. Part of the answer is, well, in some sense, you know, at a sort of national state level, you, you want basic social, you do need sort of basic social democratic institutions and, de and demands to be met before you can expect a, some sort of radicalization sort of beyond that, which is, um, so that's one, that's one example. I would also say, you know, um, uh, I, I would, I'm, you know, I'm, I'm a sort of DJ, and, it, and this kind of thinking does it, it, it does sort of influence the sort of aesthetic decisions I've made about the sort of the sort of events I organise and the ones that I uh, and, and the kind of music I'm interested in. And broadly speaking, I'm sort of and again, people in Berlin will hate me saying this, but I'm sort of dubious about the proposition that sort of really angry, sort of dark, you know, and kind of you know, music that kind of aestheticizes negative affect ever has a rad radicalizing potential apart from outside tiny and is isolated and self-isolated populations, if that makes sense. So, um, so I think that, uh, does that answer the question a little bit on, on different scales? All right, thanks. All right, um, we'll come back to uh, this point. Sorry, uh, yeah, okay. because we have this study circle on uneasy alliances going on, I just need to pick up on the point of oppression which, uh, and maybe you don't, you don't need to make a long answer now, but can take it for the discussion later also. But um, I think, you know, maybe it's about making uh, oppression felt rather than saying, you know, it doesn't matter for, you know, the emergence of collective agency or the revolutionary subject. If we take a non-reductive approach to, you know, thought as felt uh, in this sense that we were outlining, outlining yesterday also with structures of feeling or Williams. So maybe there is like a uh, kind of adapt, adaptation to that argument that needs to be made. Well, I mean, maybe, but broadly, I would say I would say making people feel their oppression is not what radicalizes them ever. What what radicalizes people is making them feel the potential for it, liberating themselves from their oppression. And I think those are quite distinct things, that you can make people feel their oppression, you can make oppression felt without making people feel any sense of agency or capacity to uh, go beyond it. And I think that's really crucial. And I think that is, I mean, this is an old argument now, really, but that is, that is a, you know, a, a, a real problem with a certain kind of tradition of what, you know, what Spinoza and Deleuze would call the sad, the sad discourse of the left, you know, that it wants people to feel their oppression. And the, the trouble is what happens with that, and I, and I think this is empirically true all the time, if you just make people feel their oppression, they just feel oppressed. <laughs> they don't feel like, they, that doesn't make them feel they can do anything about it. The, and it's a different thing. Now, sometimes it's closely related. Sometimes the two things are very closely related, and sometimes the moment of feeling oppression, the moment of feeling the capacity to do something about it will be you know, half a second apart from each other. And sometimes they'll be even simultaneous. But I think it's always crucial, it's really crucial to understand if, if you just tell people how oppressed they are, that doesn't make them think, great, let's make a revolution and stop it. it I mean, it, it just doesn't. Does, right. does that make sense as an, as an answer? Okay. Yes, very much. Yeah. Um, for the moment, at least, it makes uh, perfect sense. So, <laughs> without... Um, I'll simply hand it over to um, Gary Hall. Okay, thanks very much. I'm going to try and follow on from what Gemma said, or I didn't really know what he was going to say, but I'm going to try and follow on and I'm try... Sorry? I always say the same thing. I think you knew perfectly well what I was going to say. <laughs> no. You are a very speaker. Um, so, uh, and I'm going to try and share some strategies uh, which is the, what was the first question. So if, I'm sorry, I'm juggling with a lot of things here. So it's going to look like what I'm talking about today is publishing. But if what we're really interested in is creating comments, then we need to think and act and work differently to the way in which a lot of us often do at the moment. And this is what I'm really, this is what I'm actually going to be talking about, different ways of being and doing, and maybe you know, opting different kind of tones. So as a, a media theorist, what I want to do, what I'm trying to do is reinvent theory 
by breaking with a lot of the categories and frameworks of what it's currently considered to be. And specifically, I want to change it from what we might think of as the bourgeois liberal humanist model that's adopted by most theorists today. Yeah. Jem thought people were going to hate him. Uh, <laughs> uh, and this, they do this regardless of whether they're Marxist or feminist or new materialist or delusions. They still act according to this liberal model. So paying attention to publishing and how we create and publish and disseminate knowledge is just one way of addressing this. So as we know on this panel, we're concerned with effective forces, those drives and desires and fantasies and even resentments that motivate people to become part of a group and form the basis of collective forms of identification that Jem's been talking about. And as we also know, the right have succeeded in using effect as a mobilising political force. They've used repetition of slogans, take back control, make America great again, to create if you like, chains of equivalence across disaffected groups of people and mainstream their ideas, and they've succeeded in transforming the political landscape in the process. And the left, of course, has its own effective emotional themes. When it comes to theory, you just have to say words like commons and collective and cooperative and anthropocene, uh, and even effect itself to kind of realise this. But what the left have been conspicuously bad at is turning their representations into act actions that make different people in the mainstream of society especially want to constitute themselves as a group around issues such as the commons. So mobilising, this is where the question of strategies come in, mobilising some of these left effective drives in order to create institutional projects as a political force is what myself and uh, my colleagues who've been working on well, sadly for over 20, well, happily maybe, over 20 years now. And we've been doing this via a number of projects for the kind of production of free resources and the commons of the kind Cornelia and Felix are understanding as aesthetics, aesthetic practices. So as you can see, in 1999, we launched the Country Machine Journal of Critical and Cultural Theory, which is just about to relaunch out of Mexico. In 2008, Culture Machine became a founder member of Open Mantis Press, which involves multiple semi-autonomous, self-organising groups, all operating in non-rivalrous fashion to make works of contemporary theory available on a non-profit, free, gratis, open access basis. Uh, open, uh, open Mantis Press currently has 40 plus books distributed across eight book series. I don't think any of them are available in the bookshop. And OHP was in turn a member of the Radical Open Access Collective, which is a community of non-profit presses, journals and other projects formed in 2015. Now consisting of over 50 members, this collective seeks to build a progressive alternative ecosystem for creating and publishing work in the humanities and social, social sciences. And then last project I'm going to mention is the Centre for Post-Digital Cultures at Coventry and its post office research studio, where we're interested in reinventing the hardware and software and, and network infrastructures, especially those involved in the production and dissemination of theory. So the book, the journal, the seminar series, but also infrastructure that operate at a larger scale, institutions such as the archive and the museum and library and so on. And we've brought together a number of people involved in these kind of aesthetic practices. So it's myself from OHP, Yannick Odema from the Radical Open Access Collective, and Marcel Mars and Tomislav Medek from the Memory of the World Shadow Library. And so hopefully, we're already getting a sense of how we're working a little differently to the kind of individualistic liberal humanist model of authorship and what it is to be a, a theorist that's adopted by most theorists. We don't always act as, oh, where's that gone? There we go. We don't always act as virtuoso authors. We often operate in terms of communities and collectives. In fact, our theory doesn't always involve authoring at all, along with such effective labor of supporting, encouraging, inspiring. It also involves building, developing, and maintaining far more than authoring, as with Marcel Mars work with Ubu Web and ARG. 
Now, it kind of might appear that the trajectory we've been on for the last 20 years is about becoming a mobilizing political force by scaling our work on creating common resources. You know, so we've gone from the 21 journals of Open Humanities Press to the 50 plus members of the Radical Open Access Collective. However, we don't actually want to grow any of these aesthetic, infrastructural and institutional projects at all. We prefer to non-scale them, as some of my colleagues have recently taken to calling it, following Anna Singh here, by developing a relationship with a diversity of others in different parts of the world through collaboration and by allowing our content and infrastructure to be co openly copied and shared and reiterated free of charge. And non-scaling like this is important to us. It's important because it helps avoid repeating that centre periphery model of the geopolitics of knowledge, whereby there are just a few nations at the centre of the global information networks, the UK, US, France, Italy, who are exporting and in effect universalising their knowledge and a whole host of other nations outside of the centre who don't have those kind of opportunities to export or even develop their own universal knowledge, if you like. I'm tempted to wait while Felix has finished reading that, but I'm going to carry on. So developing in terms of collaboration and reiteration rather than growth and expansion can help prevent the reproduction of that kind of state affairs. Not simply by enabling us to place more emphasis on pri privileging non-standard contributions from others understood geographically, but also in terms of BME, working class and other non-conforming identities. Although that decolonizing agenda is important to us, for example, such an approach risks for us repeat, repeating and maintaining the kind of centre peripheral, periphery relationality of power that we want to challenge. So we see this kind of non-scaling approach enabling us to produce a far more pluralistic and multipolar network, one that has a far more complex, antagonistic and decentered structure. And this kind of emphasis we're placing on multipolarity and antagonism is important because it ensures that no single aesthetic project or collective or commons becomes the one single model to rule them all. Contrary to the impression that's sometimes given, creating a unity and a harmony and a kind of Kantian perpetual peace is not what the becoming of the common and community is about. In fact, there's no common understanding of the commons. So if you look at them, Creative Commons, free software, open source, copy far left, they all have different and conflicting concepts of the commons. That said, that making of a decision in such an undecidable terrain, a, a terrain that isn't decided in advance, is just what politics is. So keeping the question of the common open like this enables us to be political in a way that many versions of the commons are not. For just as we know, Facebook has data points, so the left has data or datum points of its own. And often these take the shape of those very effective drives and desires and fantasies that constitute the basis of collective forms of left identification. Does saying the kind of words that underpin most accounts of creating the commons, so solidarity, democracy, respect, human freedom, cooperative, community, collective, does that not produce something of a dopamine rush in many of us? At the same time, we're aware that doing this kind of political work around concepts of democracy and freedom and the commons and so on is hard, and even more so in kind of improvised sessions like this. The tendency is very much to lapse back into what seems self-evident and taken for granted in common sense, even though we know that doing so maintains that kind of bourgeois liberal humanist status quo, as Gramsci, among others, makes clear. Thanks very much. All right, um, I was looking at the, the timer and it was 10 minutes and five seconds. I, <laughs> unbelievable, I'm very impressed. Um, but beyond that, um, are there any immediate questions that you would like for Gary to clarify his 
a very clear lecture <laughs> upon. Yeah. One question here. Thanks for your talk. Um, one of the main points was the geopolitics of knowledge. My question is because in these countries, in the US and France and Italy, you have the means of production of producing such knowledge. And uh, I really value uh, these open access platforms, but they don't provide the means of production to produce knowledge in um, less privileged or precarious um, countries. Uh, where you don't have these institutions? Uh, that's true, so it's not enough, that's why I was arguing, um, it's not enough to just make our work available open access. That can kind of go along with a neoliberal globalising project of, you know, Europe wants to push its work out there, wants to uni universalise it. So it's not enough to just do that. What we're trying to do is why I was talking about non-scaling. We don't know what to make our project bigger. What we're trying to do is make the infrastructure, the technology, the open source software available for, for different people around the world. They can then produce their own knowledge. So it's not just us making a, a journal like Culture Machine available to more people. It's about other people in the world being able to take uh, the means that we've developed to create a journal like Culture Machine and be able to develop their own journals, their own presses, their own infrastructure, whatever they like. So that's why we're talking about non-scaling. I must have skipped over it. Which uh, platforms exactly were those? Which platforms? On which you provide these... This uh, one uh, used to be on the public knowledge uh, okay. platform, but now it's coming out of Mexico. It's just been redesigned, so it's going to be relaunched out of Mexico. So I think they've kind of designed their own open source software. And then things like uh, Radical Open Access, it's got a whole... Um, whole variety of different projects that people can just come along and uh, pick and choose from them, the different kinds of technology. Uh, they can take one bit from one project, another bit from another, and just adapt it to their own situations, wherever they are. Yeah, just one more point. What's your, what are your thoughts on funding these projects in those places? What are my thoughts on funding? <laughs> you want me to solve the problem of funding for the world? No, 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 no. <laughs> Just uh, how you've been approaching projects, perhaps. Um, often people come to us. So we just recently had people from India. Uh, and what they do is, in some places, they want to take the books and uh, sell them. So the Open Humanities Press books, they're available on a Creative Commons license. So people can do that. So if they need that funding, to be able to do their projects, in this case in India, we're kind of fine with that. We're not saying, because we can make a lot of this stuff, most of this stuff available for free, that everyone has to in different situations, they might need that kind of funding. So we're happy to help and support them with doing that. Thank you. All right, you're welcome. All right, um, thanks a lot. And I will immediately hand over to Laurence. Thank you. Thank you very much for coming and being here for the invitation. I would like to speak to you, but now I don't see you anymore. I won't see you when you ask questions. Sorry for that. Um, so I just want to correct my curriculum. I'm not the founder of Constant. I wish I was. But uh, Constant was funded in '96 by Dirk de Witt, and I came along in '97. So it's more than 20 years ago. That's enough. Um, so about scale, I will talk from a, a position, situation, a status. I'm currently a director of an art school, the best in the world, they say. I don't know. Uh, the most experimental on our street, for sure. Um, <laughs> because we are in a very gentrified, bourgeois neighborhood in Brussels. So just to give you a scale, it's an art school. So in uh, the French-speaking part of Belgium, if you want to talk politics about Belgium, I later maybe, uh, how many uh, cultural or education minister we have, uh, and four environment ministers. So uh, it's a uh, bachelor's and master's. I mean, who gave the name of master's that should be hanged immediately? So bachelor's and master's, 13 uh, orientations in bachelor's, 16 in master's. We have, we are, uh, we have currently between 
500, uh, 500, 450 or 470, they don't know yet, students, uh, 190 teachers, so teachers from the most precarious, teaching two hours a week, once in a while, to professors. Um, and so this school is, was created in 72. So what's interesting, it's a school that was a uh, Catholic school uh, at the origin is still in the, in the basement of the school. And it was created by, among other, Thierry de Duve. And the monk, uh, the brother, who asked Thierry de Duve to create the most experimental school possible in 72. So um, if you want to know more, I can do more propaganda later. But that's to give you, the, I guess, the scale we are talking about. So uh, I will say two, two or three things because we don't have time and I have the tendency, Gary knows, to turn some 10 minutes into 20, so let's try. Um, so I will, one thing is to becoming a director. Um, and so I've put some slides behind me, so if you don't listen to me and read that, it will be okay, you have a sense of... Uh, I will not comment on this. So to become a director is um, something that is not natural. You understand? It's, it's uh, something you decide to become at one day. So uh, one thing that helps me to, to be on my feet every morning is feminism, free software, and institutional psychotherapy. And one of the guys is Jean Horry. And so Jean Horry said it's essential to distinguish, distinguish status, status, role, function. Every morning, you have to do an exercise, make a clear distinction between status, role, function. So this thing, the status is I'm the director. I'm paid for that, the payroll responsibilities, I accept it and they accepted me to take that position. The direction function is something different, is something that can be shared. Uh, it's it's a collective and moving process. The le learning function, the teaching function also. So, okay, nice to say that, but how you do that? Uh, because it can be also, we are all together and we create the best enterprise ever, you know that. So it can be also a total position bullshit, but how you make it reality. So one thing is to understand that you become something and it's a status, it's a role, it's a function and how it's distributed and acted. So the other thing I take is to take the word institution. For me, institution is a movement. It's not an establishment, it's not instituted, it's not established. It is, but it is not. So just to remind you in the dictionary, it said institution is to, something that's becoming also. But it can be also what is established. So how can we make an institution um, in movement? thinking of how it will become as institution, I will uh, institute. I don't know what the next slide, I forgot. Ah, yeah. Um, so how do you do that? So for me, it's important to increase the capacity of people to act in the school, in the, in the institution. So one thing that we do, and it's inspired, I mean, uh, as I say, I cannot get rid of my past, is in influenced by somehow uh, what free and open source software was sharing with us, that the source code had to be open. And the source code can be read, write, and execute, and modify if needed. So what we do is uh, what is possible in the legal framework that we have. So it's important that the regulations are read, understood, and adapted to our context. So the thing is that uh, what we do is to say, okay, what is the law? what we do about this, and what are the legends that are going to that. Because in any institution, I guess even in this one, there is always someone saying, no, we can't do that, because we're always doing things like that. For example, when I opened the budget in the school, some teachers were making pictures of the budget, because it was the first time in 20 years that they've seen the budget. Because so my point is to say, how can we transform the always by another always, the never by always? Like we have never seen the budget, to we always seen the budget. And what is interesting in an art school or in a school or an institution is you have regulations, you have law, you can at least try to transform. I mean, we are in a legal framework. I mean, we have to deliver diploma, the people need to be paid, so it's not fooling around. It's what we can do with what we have. And you can, I mean, 
I take the example of a, a server, how you, you maintain the server, but you have the choice between which software or not software you use, also how you work together. So here we try to write the software somehow. I mean, it's a bit, but be, uh, I want to be clear, it's not an utopia thing. I mean, we, we really try, and this is why you have that quote, to transform, I mean, to inscribe in what we have in hands. And what you have in hands in terms of institutions are the regulations. So how we do the uh, admission exams, how we do the final exams, how we name the courses. I mean, there are a lot of things that we uh, can uh, decide together. How long do I have? Uh, yeah, so. So what is important also in the process is to make visible what is invisible. Uh, because sometimes when you are in an institution, you don't want to know who is cleaning, you don't want to know how the bookkeeping is uh, organized, you don't want to be taking part on the employment uh, regulations, so on and so forth. So the point was to make visible and tangible all of this. But then how do you do to work together? Uh, so what we did is, Again, to use the regulations, because as a school, it's written in the law that we have to have different organs of concentr uh, concentration, no, consultation, negotiations, on. it's compulsory. The student council, the council where you have the pedagogical team, the administrative team, and the student, you have all of these obligations. And so we don't want to be alienated by this, we want to use that as a movement to discuss the pedagogy and what we are doing in the school. So. All of the, these meetings and this practice are inscribed in the life of the school. It's not extra work, extra curriculum. I mean, I can tell you about the waste, the garbage, the gender, the pirate library, if you want examples. Because it's not only to talk, uh, I mean, all this administ administrative process, regulations, writing and reading, all of this cannot be sustained if there are no practical, concrete um, projects in it. Also, don't be, I mean, uh, it's an institution, it's a school, there are regulations, we are not equal. I mean, there was no way that it can become a cooperative that we can get rid of the diploma, which then we are something else. So what do we do? How do we work within an unequal uh, status? Do you remember? Status, role, function. So the status are different, but how the function is functioning is something uh, we can work in. So now, to finish, we are in the process of, uh, because I've been there two years and a half, that they were working group, general assembly, to discuss and so, so forth. It's about the change of decisions. How do we cut? How do we decide? And so we, t we together try to establish um, a more uh, stage situation that uh, they are working group, working group may propose proposals to uh, some council, the council make a proposal. I mean, so they have change of decision and reactions in the, the process because otherwise what uh, can happen is like the working group is like a kind of elite because how many people, I, I, I tell you there are 500 people or more implicated in the school, they are not implicated the same way. And it's not compulsory to be in the school to be implicated uh, in this, but how can we make all those process visible and tangible. So this is uh, where we are now. I, I think I will stop now and uh, we can go on later. Thank you. Um, before we kind of go into a, the, the discussion, are there any immediate questions to Laurence? You have to go to the microphone. I just wanted to ask very practically, um, are there other art schools interested in this process? Are there other, other people from other schools involved in this process? Or is anyone interested in this? <laughs> uh, I'm, I'm, what do you think? <laughs> Uh, I mean, I mean what's, the students are interesting. Uh, the students invite me and are interesting. But uh, this is why I'm saying it's not something that, I mean, it, this is why I'm interesting that it should arrive, uh, we are interested, that it should arrive to be written in some regulations. It's not like we are a niche of, 
crazy people in a sort of lost, I, I don't know, street in Brussels, you know, the last, Les Derniers Gaulois. It's, it's uh, something that can uh, be, yeah, applied somehow. And so some schools are asking us because, for example, we changed the election of the council, whatever, uh, Conseil de Gestion Pédagogique, which brings students, teachers, and administration together, that it can be, it's attentive to a, a, a gender. So the, the election process was worked to be, to take care of this. So other schools are asking, how did you do that? Because it's legally compulsory to organize these elections. So how did we do to arrive to gender equality or at least awareness? So I hope that we develop some tools that can be transferable. But maybe there are some art schools here. I would like to make a comment or ask a question to, to Laurence because our title is Creating Commons and you found or you entered a school which you did not create as a common. So you found, I mean, there's all, you know, huge diversity of students, uh, different people, teachers, other people working there. So how would you describe this being together? It's not a community. Um, how would you describe this being together and what is your intention? What do you want to create there? Because I, I feel a strong, I have a strong sense that you're trying to create something. What is it? Um, it's a school. <laughs> so I mean by that that uh, the students choose to come. Uh, some teachers choose also. Some teachers choose each other, they choose me. But uh, in a sense, some of us, I mean, when I arrived to the school, the team was there, so I didn't choose anyone. Uh, so how do you work together without not being the same, not wanting the same, but we have a, a place that we share. And uh, so Uri was saying also that the collective is not what uh, the establishment or the institution is what will happen. So it's the what's happening that will build something in common. And so this is why, for example, I'm, I'm sorry to come back to the regulations, the kitchen, the waste, uh, the admission, admission exams, the evaluations. I mean, all the things that constitute the human, non-human relationship. The, I mean, how this is what will become. I, I don't know what it will become. It's not me to say. Um, it's true that I'm the director, so I set some... Um, some I took what was there and, and make it work so people can um, uh, think they can do, do it. For example, for the jury, I say, okay, you're free to decide who is a member of the jury, you can speak with the student. We can do that? Uh, yes. So it was not written any place that it was forbidden and it was a direct uh, decision. So I don't know what I, I, what I want to do is to give away the power. I mean, this is, I know, strange for the director, but... <laughs> Uh, and also, it's, uh, as Felix said, I have, I have interest in institutions, but also to say, is it possible in a, what we call an institution to try to do something together? This is personally what I want uh, to do, but there are some teachers of the school here, so it's uh, to say, okay, let's, there is the but, uh, yes, let's try it to, together. But it's work and it's challenging because we are not equal in status and so it's, uh, it's not, take, not for granted. Yeah. I have the feeling that Jerry wants to say something. Um, no, no, I, I was just nodding. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, it's an, I, I mean, I think the, the kind of institutional practices that Lamont is describing, they are really the, the kind of the, the, the direct sort of correlate of, of the kind of sort of political position I think a lot of us would want to articulate. And I think I know that that it's really, um, I mean, in terms of what, you know, in, in terms of what can be a concrete political demand of a sort of, you know, radical, of, a, of a politics informed by a sort of radically democratic idea of the commons, it is the demand that, as far as possible, social institutions like be constituted along those lines, and it, and it is a concrete demand, and it is, 
I mean, there's a, there's a long history of sort of democratic in education. I think that's what you're describing in some sense. And democratic not being the same as just the free school or, 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 or anarchism. Democratic meaning a way of institutionalizing commonality in a way that is genuinely creative and productive rather than simply, you know, sort of disappearing into its own black hole or becoming unsustainable. So I think that is really, I think it's really important. And it sounds so basic, doesn't it? And at the same time, I have the feeling it's, it's a very brave and maybe dangerous thing to do. No? 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 Of, course of course not. Okay. <laughs> um, I, I would, I mean, because also uh, Gary and Jeremy, you, you are also in institutions working. I mean, can you... What is your thinking on what you hear what Laurence is doing? I mean, it's one thing to have a theme and a, a practice of publishing, but how does your commoning thinking about commoning relate to your institutional practices? I know it does, so it would be interesting to hear a bit more about that. Um, well, there are people in our centre that are very influenced and trying to take some of those ideas and adapt them to our particular circumstances. Our circumstances are different, as in we're a research centre within an institution, so we can't change the institution. We have all the things you're talking about. Rules, regulations, power that pushes against us doing this. Um, one of the things I probably want to say about the Commons is the Commons doesn't exist kind of free of all other kind of processes. It exists in relation to the public and the private. And I guess what we're trying to do is um, alter the hierarchy that they, those public, private, the commons comes in. We're trying to take tendencies, which is also what I hear uh, when you describe uh, your practice and what's happening with you, take tendencies that are already there and we're trying to value them more. So we already do a lot of this kind of care work or this democratic work or this political work we already do that, it just often doesn't get valued. What gets valued is you know, what fits in with, in our case, a very heavily, I'm talking about England, not just about my institution, a kind of very neoliberal version of the university. But it still relies on a whole load of commons-based care work, collaborative work, it just doesn't value it. So what we're trying to do is change that hierarchy a little bit in sort of the ways that uh, Jeremy was describing when he's talking about uh, yeah, those joyous effects of bringing people together. What makes people want to work in my centre and your centre, I think, is precisely that feeling. Not that they're feeling really oppressed, although sometimes they might, but that kind of, you know, things can happen. They can do things that they're really excited about in a way that they're excited about. You want me to talk about, <laughs> about institutional practice? Well, I mean, if, if you're in a British university at the sort of bottom, the bottom of the extremely rigid institutional hierarchy in 2019, then your scope for the kind of institutional action that we're talking about is basically zero. I mean, there, there, there's no scope. And the reason there's no scope is because there's no resource. And I think an, an important point is that the kind of... Uh, the kind of institutional experiments we're talking about and also I would say when we're talking about education generally the most kind of creative the most democratic the most sort of uh, collectivist types of practice are all very resource intensive so I can't really speak about anything much within the university but I mean we you know apart from trying to survive um, and the response like a lot of people I mean to some extent like some of the things that Gary's done the response of uh, people in the UK the sort of academics in that situation is increasingly to, to have to do things outside the university um, and to try to constitute kind of networks or institutions where some kind of, you know, more sort of creative sort of pedagogic practice can go on. But I would say, I mean, this is an example of the differences in, you know, what's possible in different political, political contexts because, I mean, really, I mean, I do a lot of sort of free education for sort of activists and artists and people in, in London, but mostly what they want, they don't, they don't want... They don't want, for example, to be in sort of Paolo Freirean, you know, egalitarian seminars. They want me to give them a two-hour lecture about something they don't know about because they don't have time. They're too precarious. Their time, their time is too scarce. 
you know, and they haven't even, nobody has taught them the, the basic stuff they want to be taught about you know, political theory, whatever I'm talking about. So, so it's as much time as I have or they have for me to give them a two hour lecture, we have, we have a chat about it and they go home. And that's, you know, I do that for free um, because I think it's an important thing to do. But, but I think that is, you know, that is all sort of exemplary of the way in which the capacity to do these sort of things um, at a localised institutional level is always dependent on a bigger macro political and economic context. And if you're in a context where the basic infrastructure of social democracy has been almost completely destroyed, you can't really do it. Um, and, and especially you can't, it's very difficult to do under conditions of extreme precarity. You know, where everybody involved is, is, is extremely precarious, time becomes extremely constrained. I think it's very important to understand that you know, the precarity, as a, yeah, in, in a phenomenon I'm sure many of us are very familiar with, you know, precarity is a specific strategy of control and strategy for disciplining populations precisely because it makes any form of su substantial collective action extremely difficult because it forces people into a situation in which they are obliged to spend most of their time in highly individualized projects for sort of self, you know, for sort of, you know, self-preservation and, and self-survival. And that, you know, and I think that mechanism has to be resisted and partly, indeed, that's partly why one of the things that has to be resisted is that production of sort of depression, of alienation, of sad affect. That's partly one of the things that always has to be resisted at the level of any kind of cultural struggle, but I think it also tells us something important about the historical moment that we're in. I think this is, this is a sort of narrative that doesn't get articulated often enough, that we're living in a historical moment which is different from prior moments when people experienced intense capitalist precarity, because precarity is not a new situation at all for, for people living under capitalism. What's new about it is that we have lived through the experience of, sort of post-war social democracy. We have lived through the experience of several decades of that. And the, the capitalist class, I think, in very crude terms, the capitalist class found out in the 1960s what would happen if they allowed people to have the experience of, you know, of non-precarity. You know, if they allowed people to have a relative experience of not having to worry about what, you know, where their next meal was going to come from or, or how they would feed their children a year from now. And what they found out was there was a huge wave of demands for all, kind, all kinds of democratizations. There was the creation of insane institutions like these art schools in Belgium. And, um, and they're not going to let that happen again if they can stop it. You know, so, so precarity is a very deliberate response to that. Precarity is a deliberate response to the realization that if people under capitalism are not precarious, then they will use their kind of collective capacities to make demands that they don't want to have to meet. Is there questions from the audience at this point? So now it's getting really interesting. No, I'm afraid we're out of time. <laughs> Gary, yeah. can I ask a question? Sure. Oh, I think it was interesting to hear uh, what you just said. Jeremy, because you're being uh, very negative, actually, after cri <laughs> criticizing negativity, but it's like you did it very well. Uh, and, and so I, I think one of the big issues is, is the fact that, that as you mentioned, uh, you know, the, we had this, re this precarity and, and uh, the problem is that the commons have to draw people into a, you know, different way of thinking, but the money's on the other side. And, and I see this permanent, this complete economic struggle and, and you know, penetrating people's uh, identities as, as one big issue. And just to have a little word about the um, negativity, um, I think it's, I mean, the problem of the, the, the theme of the effect or this, this concept for me is a little complicated because I see some s sort of normative aspects to it. I, you know, because I, I like if you talk about, I mean, how would you, <laughs> I think there are other terms from sociology which could also serve, but w which I think are more related to um, historical materialist ways of analyzing things and economic things. And I don't know how, for example, you could explain the American civil rights movement by not talking about, you know, 
oppression as a mobilizational force. And also, one last word about negativity, I think uh, gallows humor uh, is a very effective instrument, and it was in the French Revolution. Uh, so I wouldn't, you know, humor for me is a very important motor force, and that has a lot to do with negativity. Sorry. Okay, maybe before. We are, no. Sorry to interrupt you. Um, is there other questions we want everyone to have the opportunity to ask a question? We collect some questions, and then we're happy if you answer, okay? Yes, um, please go ahead. I'd just like to ask a question, kind of linking the three, which is about um, the scaling of agency. Um, uh, Gary talked a bit about the non-scale. Um, Laurence talked about the scale of the institution, of how different levels of organisational uh, change can shift in different types of scale. Uh, I'd like to know uh, your thoughts on the on how those flows of potent connectedness can happen at different scales. Um, okay. okay, thank you. Yeah. Hi, I know from a good source that um, your position uh, in Erg Laurence is for a limited amount of time. Um, so uh, I was also wondering, I think also for Gary, um, how do you deal with longevity or what if you're no longer there? Yes, please. Hi. Uh, yes, my question would be um, to Jeremy, but uh, to all of you, uh, and which is uh, how does this, uh, the practice of creating commons relate and engage with uh, negative effects that, as we see now, uh, can also be very powerful. And uh, again, as an opposition to the whole uh, neo-capitalist system is uh, giving birth, or maybe we could also say rebirth, to this kind of uh, social nationalisms, which are very much based on maybe not really potent collective, but uh, impotent collectives. So this is, I'm taking out of uh, Bifo's uh, last book, but it, it's really like the fact that this, this impotence, this feeling of impotence is actually a very powerful uh, effect and it, it is somehow also um, uh, creating some, um, yeah, some collectivities or some uh, agencies uh, that, uh, yeah, that are, uh, I don't know, Definitely not uh, working towards like this kind of joyful uh, effect uh, that we were talking about. How can how can we uh, relate to that in terms of do we just resist to that, or can you also somehow heal this kind of negative effects and reverse them and engage uh, positively with them directly? Thank you. Okay, thanks a lot. And one last question yeah, over one, here. One small question. Because you were talking about negativity of oppression, and I would ask you about your negativity of depression. So, can not the negativity of depression be at certain point uh, uh, a positive factor when you, re when you realize that the old structures are so meaningless at certain point, then you feel empowered to do whatever and engage in new kind of projects. So I think this is, you know, when you think for depression as a kind of releasing agent from the old world, old structures, this can be somehow, you know, uh, have this positive value at, uh, at the end. Okay, All Jeremy, right. are you ready? We start Definitely. with the first, maybe? Two minutes. All right. Well, good, good questions, but I, I, I would say that what you've just described is, is depression ending. Is, is depression, you know, is coming to an end. The, the, the actual experience, I mean, the, the experience, the actual experience of clinical depression, I think, is the absolute best argument for the kind of conceptual model that I'm putting forward. That the, 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 you talk to anyone who's experienced clinical depression, it's an experience of a lack of agency and a lack of connectivity. And I think, sure, if, if you then realise that, you know, that your depression, for example, is being caused by social relations, which, which might then be changeable, and then you stop being depressed. Yeah, sure, that, that is a kind of moment of liberation, but it's not the depression that's liberating, it's the end of it that's liberation. It's the, it's the end of it um, that, that is you know, the moment that is the moment of emancipation. 
And I think this, I mean, this question of negativity, I, no, I am going to sort of keep insisting on this. You know, the, the moment when you know, somebody gives a little speech about how bad precarity is and everybody gets excited, you know, the, the, moment of, the, the moment there which is potent is the moment when everyone thinks, yeah, he's talking about my life. I recognise this. I recognise myself now as part of a collective who are experiencing the same thing. And that itself carries with it a certain potential for change, a certain potential for agency. That, that is the element of that moment which is empowering. Like, just hearing about precarity and why it's bad is not. You know, just, just thinking, oh, precarity is bad, it's happening to us. And I think, you know, people in a room like this are not typical. And I think, you know, we all know, we all must know, well, I do, lots of people who experience precarity, and they don't experience it as inviting them into a kind of community of solidarity. They just experience it as something relentless and unchallengeable. And it's that moment. Now, of course, of course, so of course there's a role for critique, but I think, you know, the point, I mean, you know, I, I don't think anything I've said is in any way you know, against the kind of tradition of historical materialism. The traditional historical materialism says that the reason why you identify structures of oppression and critique them is to demonstrate their contingency and therefore their changeability. Okay, it's never just to change them. That's why you know, reading Marx is never sad. Now, Marx is never just saying, oh, it's terrible, you know, capital. Now, Marx is always, from the beginning, talking about the contingency of these social relations and, and, the, and the fact that they might be changeable. That's a fundamental thing. Civil rights, I think, is a very good example. I mean, civil rights is the example I, I would always give to illustrate my case. Civil rights doesn't ha you know, Jim Crow has been in place for 150, you know, for 100 years by the time civil, when civil rights gets going. It's, it's, it's a particular set of collective experiences in two main sites, the Communist Party, and the black churches, which gives rise to the civil rights movement and the possibility of the civil rights movement. And in both of those cases, what people have experienced is a new sense of collective possibility, a new sense of the possibility of collective organization. Now, of course, there has to be something for them to organize around, but I think, again, it's not just an experience, it's not just an experience of oppression. And I think the experience of slavery amongst different populations and the fact that populations can experience slavery for a long time without you know, resisting it, I, I think is, is important for, for understanding that. So, uh, so I would still say that it, it's the experience of a certain radical potential, a certain collective potential, which is always the thing which you know, gives rise to so Im Im emancipatory patriarchy projects. I think on the question of fascism, it's always one of the questions when you're talking about these issues, like, oh, do fascists experience joy? You know, do fascists experience joyous affect? Or are they experiencing something else? Are they experiencing negativity? I mean, again, I would say, really, I mean, if you look, you look at a phenomenon, I'm not going to try and talk about um, sort of situations here, which I, I'm, I don't know enough about, apart from anecdotally, but you look at a phenomenon like Trumpism, you look at a phenomenon like Brexit, then you are definitely looking at people experiencing a certain kind of joy in their collective agency, even if, they could, even if it's just in their capacity to disrupt. If it's, uh, so I, I don't think it is... I don't, I, they might talk about feeling, having felt powerless, but I don't think it is actually an experience of powerlessness that is motivating them. I think it is a sort of realisation of a certain collective potential. And I think the realisation of that... I mean, historically, I think that... You know, I think that the, the sort of so-called, I don't really like the term, but the so-called populist right has emerged in context where basically the, the, you, the absolute power of the kind of political class who's jo had the job of administering neoliberalism since the 1970s has clearly broken down. Their control of the situation has clearly broken down, mainly for economic reasons, because they just can't offer people the, the levels of debt fuel consumption that they were able to uh, before the 2008 crisis. And in that context, what people are experiencing is not their own, just their own oppression. They're experiencing the possibility that this long period of neoliberal hegemony might come to an end. So again, I would say it is an experience of kind of of potential and a potential, the potential for change, uh, which is sort of, which is being realised there, is being expressed there. All right, all right. So, um, so I'm, I am going to hang on to this point that I think, you know, it is, it's always an experience of, of collective potential which mobilises people. Like, it's never just sort of negative or sad affects. Okay, I would also like to give Gary a chance to answer to the scalability question. And, uh, and I, th I would suggest that we end with Laurence because for us she's this, you know, an example of changeability, trying to to demonstrate it within the institution, but please, Gary. Okay, so as usual, I'm not going to do what you're telling me to do. Um, okay, so, 
uh, just to pick up from what Jem was saying um, about precarity and this being a kind of a new era, a new experience of it. I mean, partly you could say some of the things he's talking about in terms of Brexit and Trumps is, a, is generated by this feeling of precarity and people just not wanting to uh, put up with it before. What we're talking about is, yeah, it generates what you might think of as, as negative effects. And what the left haven't been good at is, is doing something more uh, joyous with it. I'm always kind of, and this is for me in Gemma, and we won't get him started again, uh, but this is for, I'm kind of curious, because the last time uh, I saw Gem speak was on a, uh, an event on about the city, and I'm kind of curious, given our shared kind of background, how much it flips back from culture to economics and the kind of money, and I'm kind of, Curious about that, but we'll have to talk about that uh, kind of later because you could say what the right's been better at has been the cultural part of it. Obviously, they do have uh, the money and things. Uh, I don't know. I don't how comfortable I feel about talking about longevity in the sense of my post is <laughs> not time dependent. Um, one of the concerns I would have is um, yes, uh, for me not to do it. Uh, forever I would have to walk away or we would have to generate funding for someone else to do it or you know I have to wait till someone else is in a position where they want to take on all the role and status <laughs> and responsibility um, so that is a real issue for me and I am quite concerned about it for all the reasons that you're uh, talking about it yeah and I would also say that uh, Jem isn't at all I don't experience it as negative he does kind of a lot of really positive joyously effective um, so, so we have uh, 30 seconds. Uh, <laughs> so uh, about uh, sustainability and longevity, I mean, it's true that I have five-year contracts. I, half of it, I don't know what I will do. But when I become director any place, I always be, think that well, the result should be that the direction should be expulsed, meaning it's not the status is not necessary anymore, but the function is. So, but to be clear is to say, normally, if everything goes fine, the, the change, I mean the change, the desires or what is collectively desired will be written somehow, somewhere in the regulations of the school. So the next director that you will choose should or will be, uh, she or he or it will be, uh, I mean, they will have guidelines. The power is the power. They can get, get rid of us. I have experienced this also. They can pull the plug. But nevertheless, I think it's possible to try. And uh, I don't want you to, to think, I mean, compared to Britain, every country is a paradise in terms of uh, social uh, security and so on. Belgium is not that great, huh? but so it's kind of okay. But I think within the public institution, in the school, during the hour of the classes, something can be done. So the, the capacity of possibility of the students is really important and they should take it in, a, in their hands now. Okay. That's a good word to end. Felix? Okay, then thanks a lot to Jeremy, Gary, and Laurence for joining us. It looks like it needs to be continued. <laughs>